So chapter 51, disaster response as it relates to paramedicine. Um, the really cool thing about disasters is we can't really uh, plan for them. It's kind of, well, that's not a completely correct statement or most accurate way of saying that. We can't, ex we don't know when to expect them. They happen un unexpectedly with little to no warning. And... <sighs> I, that's kind of the nature of a disaster. That's part of what causes the issue. So our role is going to be uh, lays more in being prepared for the potential disaster, knowing the disasters that you have in your area, knowing the risks in your area and being prepared for them. If you lived in Denver, Colorado, this situation would probably not uh, uh, be a concern for you. But living in New Orleans, that's an issue. In fact, what was it, a couple of years ago that we had a um, storm here in Atlanta and a portion of uh, 7585 looked just like this um, because uh, I don't remember. It was like something with the uh, stormwater runoff in um, in the Atlanta area and, and uh, Chattahoochee was backed up and all that kind of stuff. So various things can happen. And, you know, we may have some warning, we may have no warning. Uh, and so what we're gonna do is look at some of the different concerns that we need to have uh, when it are in mind in reference to various types of disasters. You're gonna be like, well, that's not got anything to do with us. Well, you're right, but we don't know that you're gonna stay here in Georgia for the rest of your life and this is a national curriculum. So, or Mississippi. So, all right. <laughs> What kind of personnel do you need? What kind of equipment do you need? Where are you going to be able to transport to? A major part, uh, our major complication of most disasters is the impact that the event itself has had on the physical structure of the hospital. Sometimes the hospital wet fares just fine, no big deal. We still have a place to transport our patients. Other times, there's a huge issue with that. And um, I got to sit in on a, it wasn't, I want to say it's a debrief, but it was a lecture that was explaining kind of as an action after action report on a tornado that hit uh, um, was Missouri, uh, jo uh, um, not Jothan, Joplin. Joplin, Missouri. It was a um, tornado that hit there. Uh, they had like 1,600 patients um, that they had with uh, EMS, which was only one third of the total number of patients. Um, both of the hospitals in the town had been hit and um, damaged heavily. Um, it was quite a a significant disaster. I think it was like an F5 tornado went down their uh, major business and um, commercial business and commercial residential district um, right in the middle of the afternoon. So worst time of the day for it to have hit. So oftentimes at the beginning of our career, we're the uh, low man on the totem pole, we're in the ambulance, we're out doing the work. So some of this other stuff right here, the beginning planning and after planning um, doesn't necessarily affect us, but hopefully you won't stay in that role for your entire career, that you will have the opportunity to progress and have some information here to uh, build on. But you as the individual, as that individual paramedic should be prepared for what's going on. Certain times of the year, i.e. last week, a risk of snow and ice was a real concern. And it's something that we should be ready for and have, you know, changes of clothes and extra equipment at our station, you know, for cold weather gear and such like that, so that we're re prepared in the event something happens. Some of the worst snows that I have had to work on or work through came relatively unexpectedly without a whole lot of um, warning ahead of time and uh, not a lot of planning time. So um, here's a really good thing to think about. Where is your daytime and nighttime populations and how will they affect the disaster? If you remember back in 2014, was it 14? Yeah, yeah, it was early. It was like January 14 or something like that. 
um, there, we had that major ice and snowstorm that hit Atlanta, mostly ice. Um, and for Atlanta, it was significant. But it hit at like 11 o'clock in the morning, 11.30 in the morning. There, uh, Everybody was at school. Everybody was at work. And when it started to snow and meteorologists kind of got the impression that this was going to be more significant than we expected, they told everybody to immediately go home. So when the bulk of the storm hit, the roads were in gridlock from all of that snow um, fall. I think it was a year or two later couple years later maybe or maybe it was the same year it was just a few weeks later they had a, we had another snowstorm come through but that one came through at 11 o'clock at night so everybody was at home the situations between those two were completely different because of where everyone was located and that plays a huge role in your anticipation for potential issues and problems and such like that All right, so um, hopefully your commanders, your supervisors will plan ahead for this kind of stuff. Um, all of this is kind of what's handled by the EMA and even FEMA to some extent. All right, um, hopefully people are making these com uh co having these conversations your your ema directors and such he's a little outside of your jurisdiction however here's something to consider if you're in the middle midst of an event and you start having a over you know start being overrun with people who aren't actually injured or hurt um but an example would be the you know an ice storm or a snowstorm or something and they're all just stuck on their cars on the road Maybe transporting them to the hospital isn't the best idea, but what if gathering a whole bunch of them up and driving them to the closest um, restaurant or department store or something like that where they can shelter in a semblance of warmth and uh, get them off the road, that might make uh, that might be a reasonable option um, that you would participate in. I think this is supposed to simulate or uh, depict a disaster response plan drill and uh, practicing these out. Anytime you hear of these happening in your area, I would re I would encourage you to participate in at least one. Um, these are really great experiences to kind of get an idea of what kind of chaos is going to ensue, how much um, things will go. Um, out of, off the rails how out of control everything will be and i know it sounds like i'm being negative towards them but that's the entire point of these drills is to say we have a plan let's execute this plan and then realize quickly that our plan what missed a lot of details so let's reevaluate this plan um so please take advantage of those type, types of opportunities <laughs> All right, there you go. Communication backup plans are a really good, uh, important thing. And that is something you as the event individual should, if you aren't familiar with it now, you need to go um, next time you're at work, figure it out. What is the communication backup plan? In the event of a disaster, if your radios aren't working, how will you communicate? If your computer system is not working, how will you record and log calls? If your MCT, your your mobile uh, communication terminal, your dispatch uh, computer isn't working, how will you receive your dispatches? And do not say, oh, I'm going to use my cell phone. Because in those situations, you're probably not going to have a cell phone. P cell towers are down. Uh, the cell the cell circuits are uh, overwhelmed. Uh, you won't be able to make contact. Now you can get. Uh, the cool thing is they have the opportunity now. If you can demonstrate to your cell phone company that you are a first responder, you work in uh, EMS, fire, law enforcement, disaster response. You can get your plan set for a priority. Um, and that way, in the event of an emergency like that, your phone calls would take priority, but that becomes, um, that's 
still depending on the fact or the idea that the other end, whoever you're calling, is going to have connection and power and all that as well. So be familiar with what your department's processes are in the event of a communications failure. I think this all kind of goes basically with what I just said. And always, 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 always hide from the camera. Do not, do not talk to media unless you are the public information officer. Do not talk to cameras and be very cautious who you talk to or in front of in just the general public, especially during a disaster. Um, there we really don't know what's going on in these situations, but the general public knows that we respond to the requests for help. So they look to us as the ones who have information, who are familiar with the current situation. Uh, we saw this during COVID. We saw this back when the Ebola scare happened. We saw, and we've seen this through most disaster plans um, throughout our experiences that when there's an event, when there's a lot of uncertainty, um, people are going to ask you questions. Be political. We're doing the best we can. You know, if you have further questions, go look at these websites or follow up with this individual. Um, I can't answer those questions for you, but I can give you inform the contact info for the person who can. You know, that kind of a thing. Um, don't be speaking to your coworkers about things that's perfectly okay for you to talk about when you're in earshot of the general public. That tends to cause them to overhear things that are only in portion, not having full context, and so then it starts panic and anxiety and such like that. So just be aware of that. All right. Um, I love how they uh, act like immunization is going to be such a, you know, a big thing. Clicks like that's what we're going to have time to work during a disaster, um, but we'll see. Food and water has definitely um, been one of the biggest issues that I've seen throughout disasters, especially the water and. Um, having access to it because when power systems power grids fail and your water purification your pump your municipal water supplies fail a lot of people aren't prepared or expecting that all right don't worry about the zoo you don't need to worry about that okay so uh, yeah it's best to have a plan and stick to that plan, but be prepared to modify that plan. I think I've kind of already said all these things. Um, if you don't know who the command is for this particular event, if you're not familiar with how the operation is being handled, then you need to make that, uh, you make a priority of figuring that out. Who do you report to and um, who's in command and who do you receive your inform uh, your orders and your directions from? Because it's not uncommon during a major event that our dispatch procedures, our response procedures, our transport policies, and all that will change due to the increased workload. You know, I've seen it where all of a sudden we were transporting patients in um, fire trucks and in a um, in the chief's vehicle and such like that because our ambulances were. Um, too busy or too stuck or whatever the circumstance was. Do you have snow chains? Do you have a safety equipment? Do you have uh, raincoats or winter coats or uh, plenty of extra water or changes of dry clothes for you to wear? The triage and all this is going to be completely the same as it was in our last uh, couple of units, so I'm not spending time here. Now, patient tracking can become a pain in the butt, um, but 
If you're transporting singular patients to a hospital during a disaster event, it is important that you acquire as much information as you can about that um, person. You name, birth date, if they're obviously if they're talking or you can find your wallet or something like that. In a mass casualty event where you have a whole bunch of um, victims all at the exact same time, like, you know, a building collapse or tornado hits a building or there's a, a, a uh, accidental explosion or a shooter shooter event active shooter event you might have a whole bunch of patients you're taking multiple patients at a time and you may own your report may simply be a name and a birth date a you know this was their a noted injury and this is where we took them that kind of a thing that may be all you can get during a longer event like a hurricane uh, or the cleanup after a, t a tornado or an ice storm or something, then you're probably still going to be doing a normal PCR and full information for that patient. But find out what the current make sure you're familiar with what your policy is at that time. How are we transporting and how or how are we documenting our patients? All right. Um, don't neglect these needs for your crew, your coworkers, yourself, um, your partner. Make certain that they take the time to eat and drink. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I can keep going. Yeah, maybe you can keep going, but it's going to be better if you can drink something now or if you can eat something now. Make certain that you watch out for your coworkers and that they keep um, hydrated during these events. And we've kind of covered a lot of this under um, in some of the other sections that we went through, the use of uh, post-incident stress debriefing, um, talking about the concepts of PTSD and working through the mental health aspects of this. Stay, uh, with the, stay in contact with each other, uh, communicate, give people room to talk, give people room to be quiet if they need to, but um, yeah. Yeah. All right. I think I already talked a little about that. I definitely already talked about that. Um, and I've mentioned this to a large um, extent. Remember, as you move further up the ranks, your role is going to be more that uh, less that of handling patient care and direct interaction with the public and more so with supporting and facilitating your uh, those that you're supervising or those that are looking to you for leadership, helping them do their job. So your focus is going to be on inspiring them, per, um, supporting them and equipping them for what they need to do as well as giving them the direction as to where where resources are needed most and such like that. All right, so after the event, um, these processes can uh, vary greatly based on the circumstances to how the after event um, debriefs um, are going in meetings and if, uh, responsibilities are handled. Your role in that may be very limited to almost none, or it may be very significant based on when and how you responded and what it was. So there's a lot of range here. I'm, I'm not trying to be vague, but there's just such a variation of uh, circumstance. It is important that all, uh, this is something you should always keep in mind if there's been a major event and if you know that it was or likely will be declared a disaster, whether by the state or federal, um, if it's de declared a disaster, an emergency event or something like that, then there are federal and state funds available for the repair and restock of equipment. Um, so any equipment damaged or um, 
consumed during the response or during the response to that event should be carefully logged by your unit um, and this this can be every detail about your ambulance that may have you know, let's say you had snow chains and they came off and it scratched the whole side of the truck to pieces that would be something you need to record and document. So be prepared to keep a, uh, a log of all of the equipment that you used and anything that needs to be repaired or replaced afterwards because that is very likely to happen. Now, I don't mean that they'll actually fix it. They'll probably reallocate the funds for another project within the department, but it's important that you log that um, and uh, provide your supervisors with that information. All right. Um, yeah, I think we I think we're covered, we've discussed a lot of this kind of stuff already. Remember to tell people when they did a good job. All right. So let's look at some of these actual disaster events and consider some of the uh, uniquenesses of each type of event. So a lot of our role, or excuse me, a lot of the aspects here are going to, or excuse me, a lot of the impact on us is going to be related to how we can respond to a scene and transport from it. So driving in the various conditions that we are uh, working in, that is a concern. Things like uh, a tornado or a tsunami, these are rather sudden and like kind of a one and done event like the, the wave comes in and washes everything away or the tornado blows through and washes it away and you don't really have a whole lot of change after that whereas floods uh ice snowstorms wind uh like hurricanes these can be rather evolving events um because of the broader scale of the um of the storm and of the disaster and so uh it can look like everything's going great and then all of a sudden something else changes and complicate things are m complicated far more than they were kind of like with uh hurricane katrina back in 2005 the storm went through new orleans and yeah there was damage tore off the roof of the superdome and like there was a lot of damage in the city from it but there really wasn't a lot of flooding the flooding didn't happen which the flooding ended up being the major disaster and the uh the biggest issue they had to deal with Flooding didn't happen until the storm had uh, traveled further inland and flooded out the power stations and shut down the power grid. So this was a, from New Orleans standpoint, the storm had already passed, but now the storm was up uh, further up, further inland. The power grid shut down. The pumps for the levees were um, shut off. Their backup generators failed, and, and then the whole city flooded. So that was an example of an evolving event where things changed. Yeah. Um, GPS is going to be very helpful in an event because the GPS map didn't change, but everything around you did. So you may not recognize uh, where you are or what the street names are. Street signs could be missing, such like that. Um, All right, so forest and brush fires. Fortunately, we have a really good burning program here in the state of Georgia. Uh, the, a lot of the public land and even pro large tracts of private land regularly get uh, burned. Um, so we don't end up having the massive conflagration fires that they have out west. Florida struggled with this for a number of years back in the early 2000s. Um, horrible, horrible forest fires. Um, and they would decimate whole towns and such because of the density of vegetation. Fortunately, this doesn't happen as much there anymore because they've gotten a lot more um, aggressive with their management of forest and wildlands and allowing smaller fires to, to burn and prevent that from happening. 
our role in a forest fire is going to play heavily with um, re evacuation of people in the path of the fire and then um, monitoring and providing first aid and care within the shelters of the fire. That's kind of the auxiliary role, but then your primary response units um, will be transporting injuries and such like that. Um, fortunately, during fires, there's um, not often a whole lot of injuries specifically related to the fire, but um, you're going to have a lot of your breathing problems, stock up on your oxygen, your nebulizer supplies, the smoke in the area is going to um, aggravate asthma and breathing, you know, COPD breathing conditions and such like that. Um, so be prepared with your smoke inhalation or reactive airway conditions and your heat exhaustion and such like that. Those are the kind of equipment that you're going to want to have stocked if there's one in your area. Mm, all right. Your PPP, PPE is not going to be related to firefighting in these circumstances because that's not your role. But you might need to have a mask or something to help cut down on particulates. All right, snow and ice. Make sure you have snow chains. Make sure you have antifreeze and coolant that um, is the correct type in your vehicle. Uh, I would encourage you to have some form of shovel in the at in the apparatus as well as some ice melt some of that salt road salt or something like that um and be prepared with that you can go all out and have yourself a fire starting kit and things like that but generally speaking that's not going to be our concern or, uh, or a big issue for us as the responders but I have definitely seen where people were doing that on the side of the road because their vehicles were out of gas and they were freezing. So they started campfires in the snowstorm. <clears throat> Wear layers. Be prepared during these events to have layers. Um, and know what resources you have to um, available to you, your local EMA, to your department, do you guys have ATVs? Are there um, alternate uh, vehicles that you can use to get into iced roads and such that might make it easier for you to remove patients? Think outside the box. You don't always need to drive the ambulance into that area when there's another um, apparatus available that might maneuver easier. So tornadoes tend to be pretty rapidly evolving events, and then they're just kind of over all of us about as fast as they begin. During the actual tornado, always plan to be in shelter. Do not expect, do not prepare or plan to be out on the road. Um, if you think, it, you know, I think it's a good idea to be out and ready to go and for the event that people are injured. Well, don't be on the road during the torn when the tornado is on the ground because you put yourself at risk of being um, blown away by the tornado, but also um, you may end up responding to the wrong area and be further away from the event. So um, make certain that you are just secure in a stormproof shelter and then wait for the event to pass so that you can respond to and transport patients. In rural communities, tornado injuries are um, rather few and far between just because of the density of houses in suburban and urban environments it's a very different situation all right um i think we all know what a, cat a hurricane is so um these are very long, drawn-out events with multiple different preparations. You've got the wind concern, you've got the rain concern, you've got the flooding concern afterwards. There may be tornadoes associated, there may be uh, lightning strikes and fires associated. It can cause power grid failures for uh, weeks on end. Um, these are some of the most difficult disasters to be prepared for while at the same time they're some of the ones we have the most warning and preparation for 
never try to drive through water that you standing water on the roadway um, or, or, or like moving water like where a uh, creek or something has flooded the road that is that will wash your ambulance away thankfully this is not something we need to worry about here um Although you may end up living somewhere where this is a concern someday, tsunamis are a mess. It looks to me like these vehicles were jumbled together by the wave and then caught fire because they all look burned out. Um, so earthquakes haven't been a big issue around here but that could change uh the new madrid fault line which runs down the mississippi river valley is on, is not that far away from us and it is the site of the largest uh, recorded earthquake in the history of the united states so we often think of california and the san andreas fault and such like that as being the uh fault lines to be concerned for of but uh, new madrid fault is one of the largest faults in the u.s and most concerning it's also been dormant the longest and so i know that geologists predict that there's going to be a large quake but you know who knows that could be a hundred years from now so one of the big changes that we will see during earthquakes because the primary issue with an earthquake is structural collapse, building collapse, road bridge collapse. Um, we're going to have huge issues with response um, because normal roadways and access is going to be lost. But when people are pinned in the structural collapse or vehicles or something like that, that's where we're going to see uh, crush syndrome more frequently. Uh, it's much greater likelihood simply because it's going to take us so long to get to all of the different trapped um, victims. So be prepared in those situations if you're at the station when it goes out stock up on your bicarb stock up on your um uh, other medications like atropine um and uh calcium chloride albuterol such like that because the uh, tourniquets the you're going to run a whole lot more um crush syndromes than you ever imagined during a uh, earthquake event All right. Uh, thankfully, these are not something we see here. Landslides, mudslides, avalanches. But again, a rather quick event. Um, the event happens and then it's just kind of trying to figure out what roads are still accessible and how to get to the people who are needed or who need help. Um, a lot of the focus is going to be on um, for us in EMS is finding alternate route routes around the damaged zone. We already talked about cave-ins and trench collapse uh, previously, so um, kind of just keep on moving with this. It's an example of a trench rescue, ensuring equipment. Been a minute since we've had one of these in the United States of any sort. Um, you know, I think St. Helens was the last major volcanic eruption in the continental United States. Um, and it was quite a significant situation, but uh, these happen in other parts of the world, um, frequently in Hawaii. I think it kind of is easy to explain anticipate the injuries associated with a volcanic eruption. I've already talked about flooding to a large extent. Um, if you ever see a red ball floating in the water during a flood event, stay far away from it. That's probably a fire ant mound.
actually got to see a sandstorm one time um, out west. I was in West Texas heading into New Mexico, and it was a really interesting event to see the sandstorm blowing across the desert and um, then around the vehicle we were in. Fortunately, it wasn't as intense as some are, but it is crazy how much of a blackout situation is created or brown out with the sandstorm um we were in a vehicle the whole time so we had plenty of uh filtration but being outside you had had to have protected your eyes and face because it, it was a lot of um very coarse sand and it would have uh, stung uh, a, a drought yep yep we're gonna respond to a drought um sometimes i feel like they're just like stretching here a little bit and then and then there's winter winter's a disaster apparently so we're gonna keep moving and then there's summer summer's a disaster too stay hydrated work in pairs yeah okay let, let's move on. Hey, did you know that using a air conditioning in a heat wave can be helpful? I mean, come on, people. Frankie, you need to place wet towels on your head in the sun. And then if all else fails, there's the meteorites that can come down and hit your patients and create a disaster. Um, while there are some documented examples of people being struck by meteorites, that's an extremely rare and unlikely event. Um, most of the time, uh, meteor and space debris uh, are consumed as they pass through the atmosphere, and if they don't, they're of large enough mass and velocity to create a rather significant um, amount of damage, but very rare. So anytime your patient complains of sudden sharp pain and localized bruising, maybe they were hit by a meteorite. And like, no joke, somebody somewhere showed me that that was a question they got on some quiz or some exam or so, I think it was uh, prepping for registry or whatever that the answer was a meteor. And I was like, what the heck? And then there's pandemics. After the last couple of years, I think we can skip this section. We were rather familiarized with these. If you're uh, sick, we no longer pull them from duty. Um, according to the CDC, sick patient or uh, employees need to report to work and continue working. Did you know that a cough can be transmitted six feet? And the bottom line right there, the bottom point, the one that we missed two years ago, totally should have been telling people how to care for the sick people at home instead of expecting the healthcare system to take care of everything. Totally missed that step. All right. We already discussed structure fires in our special view, um, technical rescue chapter, so I'm going to move through this one. Building collapses were handled similarly. Uh, building collapses were also discussed with explosives during the terrorist uh, cha terrorism chapter. Uh, most of the time in a building collapse event, you are going to be waiting outside the hot zone and receiving the victims while trained rescuers bring the victims to you. Um, lockout tag out, that's typically for being able to shut off equipment, um, shut off power to a circuit or something like that where you're 
have people working on a piece of equipment or whatever and they want to shut the equipment down and then they'll tag it out saying i shut this equipment down do not turn it back on that way um only the person who turned it off can turn it back on um the, so in order to prevent electrocutions and problems like that I think another less commonly considered um, issue related to power failures and power disruptions when they extend for you know hours to days is people with home health equipment, people who have ventilators at home or um, various uh, maybe dialysis machines at home, and now that they have had a uh, a power failure, those ventilators aren't functional or those that medical equipment isn't functional the way they need it and they don't have a generator. I've run many a call where the person just needed to go to the hospital because they needed power for their ventilator or their dialysis or something like that. I've even had people come to the station and ask if we could hand give them a generator because they had been told that the fire department or the EMS department was hand, had uh, generators available to people who needed them. And it's like, yeah, I'm not really sure where you got that idea. But um, try to think outside of the box on these. Does the person need to be transported to the hospital and take up resources there? Or is there an alternate option that will allow them to continue to function, um, uh, charge batteries for a period of time or something like that? So mostly just stay out of the way. Um, whenever I've responded to civil disturbances, riots of any type, dem public demonstrations, um, protests or whatever you wanna say, uh, we pretty much stage in the area, but far enough away that we're not going to be directly involved when things go south, but that we will be uh, close enough to pick up the pieces. Also, it's not uncommon when you're doing standbys for these uh, events that your location is going to be, um, they're going to try to keep it quiet and not publicize it. They'll want you to um, stage in an area that's not uh, readily visible to the general public, maybe behind a warehouse or something like that where you're just less noticeable. Not really sure, yeah. Um, if you have to respond to a protest event like this, you're just make it very clear that you're not there for any side, you're just there to take care of the people who need help. Um, if possible, have somebody bring the, it, the injured person or the person who needs help to you, um, avoid entering those um, areas and then plan, no matter what their complaint is, get them out of that area as quickly as possible. Even if it's a cardiac arrest, just don't plan to work them there, get them out of that area. Trying to work an arrest or provide patient care surrounded by a ring of cops is not an ideal situation. Um, and I've had I've done that before. The best plan is to get them in your ambulance, even if you know you can't do anything to save that person's life and there's no reason to take them to the hospital, get them off that scene and get them in, into a different location. This kind of goes to our, uh, we talked about this in the terrorism chapter and we'll see more of this in the crime scene chapter. So moving past all of these. I don't know why we get so worried about hackers shutting down our sys computer systems. Our computer systems seem to fail enough as it is on their own without hackers doing it. All right, so that wraps our chapter on disaster management and disaster preparedness.